And so uh, the, the topic we're coming up on has to do with CTFs. This excites me for two reasons. I've built a couple of CTFs. Uh, and it's also um, the, the way that I, I met our speaker, uh, Mark Hoops, uh, uh, maybe three or four years ago. I was trying to build a CTF and I was asking around uh, back, back where I am in Colorado, who, who knows how to do this? And I was actually pointed to you or you, you found me or something. And so this is, uh, this is pretty cool. Mark is a super knowledgeable guy. He's been in IT for 20 years. He's uh, worn a lot of hats, developer, uh, incident responder, project manager. Uh, he's also a teacher, um, so he's, he's very open to these types of things. CTF um, uh, is something that can definitely be used in training. I'm really interested to learn more. Please help me welcoming Mark Hoops. Thank you, Mark. Okay, so uh, first off, let me, I guess, give a little bit of a disclaimer that there's a, a lot of material, a lot of things that I would like to share, uh, and I, I put it all into slides and then started cutting. So uh, if there are some gaps, some things that you don't feel like are covered well enough, definitely pl uh, talk to me afterwards. I, I hopefully have some thoughts on it and uh, am happy to share. Um, so that being said, I am going to move through this uh, kind of as quickly as I can. Uh, but we do need to start out with some introduction, right? Uh, and in lieu of the traditional who am I slide, I, I thought I'd tell you my life story, or, or at least uh, some interesting parts here. So uh, really, this is the story of me avoiding boredom. Um, and so in my early, early days, my primary tool for avo avoiding boredom was a Commodore 64. It's a beautiful machine. We upgraded to 128. It was wonderful. Um, but by the time I got to college, uh, I knew exactly what I was going to do, right? I was going into computer science. I was going to do that the rest of my life. That was awesome. So I found a lovely computer science school in my backyard, go Utes, and graduated from there. Unfortunately, as I went through this uh, computer science program, I came to the conclusion that what I really did not want to do all day was spend eight hours coding, right? That, that was, it didn't sound interesting to me. There wasn't enough. Uh, um, I just thought it would be repetitive. And so I went to get a job that was not programming and found that at IBM. Um, but I didn't pick very, good, very well because what I ended up doing was looking at a screen and waiting for things to turn red. When they did so, I called somebody else, right? So this was not my solution to boredom. Uh, I moved around within IBM, and I'm going to skip that part. Um, ultimately, I ended up as a project manager, right? Or, or kind of a business analyst was my title. And I, I had my fingers in lots of different pies, but I wasn't really responsible for it. When it came time to solve the technical problem, it wasn't my job, um, and I was, I was completely bored. So then one day, I was looking around trying to find a career shift, and uh, my brother, who uh, has run Lead Blocker for me through most of my career, comes to me and he says, look, he had made the switch over to, to security a few years ago. He says, you would love security. And I said, nah, I don't think so. He's like, give me the shot, right? Like, give me a chance to convince you. And so there happened to be a Capture the Flag event that, re that, uh, that weekend, right? This was a Friday night. And so I'm like, okay, sure, why not? I'll sit down. And uh, so he walked me through the basics, set me up with a, a, a web application proxy I'd never used one before, um, pointed me at the website, started uh, telling me just the basics on how to get going. And he's like, okay, there's a bug there. Go find it. Um, and so I, I tried a few things, and he gave me some pointers, and on and on it went. And pretty soon it's 2 in the morning, and I'm still going on this website. I hadn't solved the challenge, but I guess I felt like I made enough progress that it was interesting to me. And so I'm like, whoa, 2 in the morning, I've got stuff to do tomorrow, I'm going to bed. Which I did, and I managed to get to sleep, right, because it was 2 in the morning. Uh, but then 6 o'clock in the morning rolls around, and I wake up, and I'm still thinking about this problem, right? And, and I'm thinking I could attack it this way or that way or whatever, and I'm like, that's crazy. I've had 4 hours of sleep, I'm going back to bed, only I couldn't. Right? I was, there was no way I was falling back to sleep. I got up, went down to my computer, worked for another two hours, which was as much spare time as I had. And I came to the realization that anything that was exciting enough to get me out of bed at six in the morning on a Saturday and somebody would pay me to do it, that's what I wanted to do. So uh, capture the flag, go, right? Let me catch up on some slides here. So I got picked up by a wonderful company, Aspect Security. I've been working for them for a while. And they have uh, supported me in my love of capture the flag events. They, they've supported me developing a number of these. And so my goal today is to take my love of puzzles, right, and apply it to a problem that we want to solve, right? Uh, now, personally, obviously, I love puzzles. I think that this is a pretty universal uh, 
interest, right? I, I've got my variety puzzles up there. I've got a few of those books at home. It's not just tech people like puzzles. Lots of people like solving puzzles just because they're fun. This is not new knowledge, right? Uh, Confucius, way back when, said, uh, you, you guys have heard this quote, right? I do and I understand. There's another phrasing of it which I kind of like, uh, attributed to Ben Franklin, involve me and I learn, right? Okay, so that's really this premise of if we get a, a puzzle, a challenge to solve, then we engage more completely with it and, and we actually start understanding. Now, minor caveat, neither of these men actually said the things that are attributed to them. Uh, historians say it was Jun Quang, 300 years BC, that first wrote down this idea. So we're not dealing with anything new here. Um, nor is it obscure, right? We've got lots of famous people. Uh, this slide, if you want to look at it, download it, great. I tried to find some academic studies that would support my assertion. Uh, found plenty of them, uh, but I'm not going to talk about them because we don't have time. Um, I had all set up this live demo, which would have been awesome. I've got, I've got who wanted to learn how to lock pick, right? That's a, that's a fun puzzle to solve. I was going to have one person read this very inf uh, informative piece of paper that talks about how to do it, and then the other person gets to read the same paper but they actually get a lock and some picks to practice with, right? Then I was gonna have them come up and go head to head and I don't think I need to do the demo in order for you to kind of grasp that obviously the person who gets their hands dirty actually gets to try it out is going to be more successful at this. So, cut for time, it's gone. All right, so let's circle back. Why are you here? My assumption is that all of you have some sort of responsibility with increasing knowledge amongst developers of security issues, right? Um, whether you're a developer yourself, whether you're a security team, um, kind of the purpose of OWASP, in fact, the explicit purpose of OWASP is to improve the quality of software. And so my assertion is that a, an excellent tool for doing that is this Capture the Flag event. So I'm gonna spend the rest of the time uh, talking about how to do that. Now, I keep throwing around this term, capture the flag. Uh, I think most of you probably know the term, but uh, for those of you who may not, when I say capture the flag, I'm not talking about running around in a field trying to chase another person down. Um, I'm talking about a, a computer event, right? that's a good start, uh, where the, the goal is some sort of organized application where the goal is to find vulnerabilities in a particular piece of software, right? Originally, uh, the first kind of construction of this was that you'd give each team a, a copy of a server, an identical server, right? And then the game was to find the vulnerability in your own server and go exploit it in your neighbor's server while patching your, your, your own, right? And when you exploited the vulnerability in your neighbor, you actually got this string of text, which was the flag, and that's how they scored, right? Now, there's a lot more, there's a wide variety of constructions of these events these days. Um, events that are a lot more conducive to a lot of people, but the name Capture the Flag persists. So if you go to your manager and, and pitch this idea, and they're like, a what, Capture the Flag? Now you know the history. Uh, this slide happens to be from DEF CON. It's the only event I know of, at least large scale event, that still makes the, uh, or runs an attack your neighbor style event. Um, anyway, moving on. All right, so restated again, your job, for the rest of this talk at least, is come up with a way to build this event, right? Have an application that is going to be fun and engaging for your developers to attack and to learn from. My mission is to tell you how to do that. Okay, so we're gonna start out with some basic game theory, right? Um, we're playing off this idea that the activity that we're asking our developers to do is actually going to be fun, right? If we're just running them through another CBT or another instructor-led training, as informative and as useful as those are, we're trying to go to the next level, right? We're trying to get them to really internalize these lessons and, and grasp them, right? Have hands-on experience with them. And so it has to be fun. Um, and so our, our challenges have to find the balance between being hard enough that it's actually fun, uh, yet easy enough that they can actually be accomplished in the time frame we give them. Um, so a lot of my comments are gonna be relative to finding that balance. Before we can find that balance, we have to have a pretty good understanding of who it is that we are, are targeting, right? Um, obviously, developers are gonna be our, our main target here, at least for my assumption it is, right? We wanna train developers. 
Developers have a lot of different skill sets, but I think we can assume that at least for our purposes, they've got some basic knowledge about you know, some JavaScript. They can probably write their own SQL statement. Um, you know, maybe not debug one, but, but they have the basic idea. Now, my experience has been that when I start talking with a development group, or, or particularly the management that's going to be paying for one of these events, uh, they don't want to stop there. They're like, well, let's invite the whole team. Let's get the, the QA group, right? We've got some of them attached to the department. Let's get the management involved. They need to know what their developers are talking about too, right? And that's great, um, especially if these people have sat through the same training, then this might be useful for them. But as an organizer, you need to have that in mind that um, your QA guys have a lot of great skills. They're not going to be able to, probably not, I should caveat that, they're probably not going to be able to write out a full SQL statement, which they would need in order to exploit a SQL injection vulnerability, right? So if you have this wider attendance group, you may need to make some, I'll say concessions, may not be exact right, some helps for these other groups, right? Give them a cheat sheet that maybe uh, gives them a sample SQL statement that they might want to exploit. It gives them <coughs> something that they don't have to come up with on their own. Um, on the other end of this scale, you might have security champions, right? People who are trained, uh, they're still developers, but they've been given this extra security training. You might even be running an event for your pen test team, right? Still works, you just need to ramp up the complexity of the event. All right, so. The main challenge here is where are you going to get this application that you're going to attack? And there are at least three options here, which I'm going to cover in detail. Um, the first one is not an option. Again, just about every time I've talked with a, a client about running one of these events, somebody brings up the idea, well, why don't we test our own app, right? Um, in a certain line of thinking, that makes perfect sense, right? You want to, if you're going to invest the time in working on an application and having your whole development staff take the day away from coding, why not test your own application and find out what's there? And the reason I throw this one out is it just fails the gaming test, right? Um, for two reasons. Number one, it's going to feel to the developers like they're just doing their day job, right? It's not going to generate the excitement that you're looking for. But even more importantly, you almost by definition, have no idea what kind of vulnerabilities exist in your own software. If you did, you already would have fixed them. And so what you would set up here is uh, basically a completely unknown event where you're going to go out, you're going to look at your nebulous code base, right, however deep you want to go, and you're hoping that you will find something interesting. And, and to me, that's just, it's a recipe for a disaster in an event. The chances of getting that just right, the balance of something that's hard enough to be interesting but easy enough to actually find is, is a coin toss at best, right? You're not going to do it. So I would strongly recommend you, you know ahead of time exactly what the vulnerabilities you expect people to find are. So the other thing that is often a temptation is you're working with a bunch of developers, right? Maybe you are a developer yourself. You can code an application. That's what you do every day. Um, and this can work. But <laughs> here be dragons, right? Um, let me tell you a little story. I promised stories in the intro. Um, so I've run a number of events uh, for my, my own company, right? We have an annual get together. We get together, or we, uh, all of our, our, we're all pen testers, right? We, we test web applications every day, uh, but we want to extend our own knowledge. And these capture the flag events, we love them as much as anybody else. And so for the first couple years I ran that, I wrote my own application and was reasonably successful. But let me tell you the moment when I decided, not to do this again. Um, we were working on an application. Uh, the theme of our, our summit was going to be operating system level attacks, right? We wanted to, to get beyond the web and actually upload our web shells or you know, break out of the database to get, get shell that way. Um, but we had to control that. We had to balance it. And so since we had a lot of Windows people, a lot of Unix people, we thought, well, what we'll do is we'll run it on an operating system that's almost Unix, but not quite. So at least the pre-compiled tools weren't going to work. Anybody ever heard of Inferno OS? It's derivative of Plan 9, right, which you all are familiar with? Yeah, yeah, me neither. But the other guy who I was doing this, com this competition with, uh, he knew about it. He said, it's perfect. It kind of has Unix syntax, but totally different on compiling. OK, fine, right? So we managed through. We spent, 
probably 250 hours between us getting this application up and run up, uh, you know, all developed. It was a multi-user dimension. We had a Gopher backend. It was really cool. Um, however, this is where the bad part happened. The night before the competition, like I'd always been running it on my laptop, right? That's where you develop. So we go to deploy it into our environment, and it doesn't work, right? We try to connect to the network, and it just it's not talking to us. And so we spend literally the whole night up until an hour and a half into the competition trying to figure out why on earth this application that works just fine there is not working on our server. Now, ultimately, it turned out to be a, a subtle nuance of Limbo, the language you use to program in Inferno, uh, that uh, defaults to localhost. And if you don't provide it a parameter, we didn't know that we needed to provide a parameter, whatever, right? But the point is, if you're writing your own application, you're opening yourself up to a whole lot of work that when we're developing full-blown applications, we expect, right? We expect that we're going to have to do user testing. We expect that we're going to have to do a lot of this other unit testing. But when we're writing a capture the flag event, we tend to overlook that and we don't allocate enough time. So personally, I'm done. I will not write another application unless it's for a convention where these other things won't really work. So we'll see about that. All right, option two, which I do recommend, not quite as much as option three, but option two is good. Break it yourself, right? There's lots of software, open source software out there where it's already tested, right? People run this and it's open source so you can get to the code. And so if you want an SQLI in this application, uh, hopefully your open source developers have been very diligent and they've run, written all their parameterized queries, but you can go in and unparameterize it. Right? If they're filtering their input, you can take it out. Right? So if you start with a working application, it's for a lot of different vulnerabilities, it's not so hard to back that out and actually introduce the bugs yourself. So um, again, let's talk about a story. Um, for the year after the Inferno failure, uh, we were backing off. We still wanted to do OS level attacks, but uh, we wanted to focus on a more traditional platform. Uh, and so I went out looking for some sort of open source Java application. I decided on a CRM application. It would have lots of sensitive data that would be fun to find. Uh, so I did this Google search, and I came up with this application called Hypergate. And as a pen tester, it smelled terrible, right? Just all of these red flags were set off. And I'd like to take a minute uh, to apologize if you know or were a developer on Hypergate. I'm sorry. You did lots of things great, but security was not one of them. Um, so this application had all sorts of extra features built into it, right? It's a client relationship management software. You expect it to track contacts, you know, maybe potential contract value, that kind of stuff. But they had built in an email application, like you could send stuff to each other. It was a file repository. It was a password vault. What does this have to do with a, a CRM app? So, so that smelled fishy to me. And then the, the kicker was it hadn't been updated in, at the time, three years. So I dig into this application expecting like, okay, there's lots of stuff. I should have lo lots of ways to introduce my own bugs only to find out I didn't need to do anything, right? The very first page, SQL injection, it was right there. Um, they had made so many mistakes that other than a few uh, configuration things, like I deliberately put the file repository in my web root and a few things like that, like this was just out of the box ready to go. So if you're lucky, you may stumble across one of these and can use that. However, you may not be so lucky, or you may not be a web app pen tester, right? If you're the team lead of a development team, you don't necessarily have the skills to spot those bugs or even to inject them. So what I found with my experience with Hypergate is after I'd gone through and made this great capture the flag event, and I ran it, and it was successful, and yay, go team, uh, then what, right? I had invested a lot of time into producing this application, and I had nothing else to do with it. So I, I ran it at the local hacker space. I tried to do some things, but mainly I felt kind of unfulfilled. Now, wouldn't it be nice if, uh, well, I expect a lot of people are in that same boat. They build these things, and then they don't necessarily get all the use out of them they want. But wouldn't it be nice if there was like a directory of a bunch of applications that had vulnerabilities? In fact, maybe they were programmed to have vulnerabilities. And, and you could just like pull up this list and you could go down and say, hey, I think that's the kind of thing I'd like to have for my Capture the Flag event. That would be something OWASP might sponsor, right? So in fact, there is the OWASP Vulnerable Web Applications Directory Project. You can go out. Uh, I don't have the URL up there, but it's easy to find. 
Uh, and it literally is a list of applications that meet different criteria. You can kind of see them across the top there. Uh, can be purely offline applications, online applications, uh, et cetera, right? And it will tell you, hey, this is a, a mobile application. Uh, in fact, I think just last hour somebody introduced a new deliberately vulnerable iPhone application. But you can go through and you can find these applications that are already coded, already tested, and you can basically get a list of the vulnerabilities that you can design your event around. Okay, um, I've got a couple of, of quick tips scattered through this. Uh, the first one is, is on format, right? Traditionally, we think of these events as setting up the application and having everybody attack one application, right? And in a lot of cases, that makes sense because the server traditionally has been the most expensive part of, part of your infrastructure. However, with the you know, miracle of cloud technology, it's not so hard to spin up a half a dozen or even 20 copies of your server, right? Um, in fact, a lot of these deliberately vulnerable applications, or at least some of them, uh, you know, you don't download the code at all. You just sign up for an account, it creates your, your own instance of it, and then you can go and you can create one for each member of your team and you could all be attacking the same thing. It certainly influences your gameplay, but you could absolutely run an event that way. All right, so um, we've talked about where you find your large-scale application or how you might construct it thought needs to be given to your individual challenges as well. And so there's three areas I'd like to hit on that. So the first one, how are your participants going to find this, right? Again, what the point I want to make is that as the designer of the event, you need to really think about um, how this is going to feel to the participants, how fun of it is it going to be. If they're experienced pen testers, you can pretty much just turn them loose in the environment and say, go for it, right? They should have enough experience to know where to poke, they should see signs of, huh, that looks a little fishy to me, they can probably just do it. But really the use case that we're talking about here is developers. And if you just point a developer at an application and say, find some problems with it, it's going to be challenging, right? My experience would be that they're just going to look at you and go, yeah, well, where do we start? I don't know. And so you need to provide them some sort of breadcrumbs, hence the picture of, of Gretel or Hansel over there. Um, some direction to where these vulnerabilities lie. Now, that can be an explicit clue, like, hey guys, go look at the email feature. You might find some cross-site scripting there, or better term, I think, JavaScript injection, different discussion. Uh, so you can point them that way. Uh, you could also, if your application has some pretty strong role-based authentication, uh, you could create a role that only has access to the feature that is vulnerable, right? And kind of keep your developers on rails that way. Um, there's a couple of different techniques that can do, you can do that, but somehow you need to, to help your team find the vulnerabilities. The next thing you need to think through is how are they going to actually exploit it, right? The key difference between talking about these vulnerabilities in like an instructor-based, instructor-led training class is that we want them to get in there and actually exploit it, right? We don't want to pop up an alert box. I want to steal somebody's session token, right? And so in order to do that, just again, using JavaScript injection session token as uh, the, our example, right? it's not enough for me to just put in a little bit of code. I need to put in code that will read the cookie, send it to me, and I have to have some kind of listener running on my workstation so that I can actually receive it. Right? None of that individually is, is terribly complicated, but for a developer, that's not problems they would have thought through before. So either you want to allocate a lot of time so that they can think through those, or you want to give them some hints, right? Maybe you give them a little reminder page, hey guys, this is how you use an XML HTTP request and concatenate together a couple of variables to produce a URL. Maybe you give them a command line that says, here's how you start up a simple Python HTTP server, and whatever input comes in, it's going to give you the request text, right? Or even just a netcat. However you want to solve that problem, give them some helps depending on the, the complexity of the exploit, so that they're going to be successful in actually landing it and being able to move on to the next step. Uh, another quick tip here. Uh, if we're talking about JavaScript injection, uh, one path for gameplay is to exploit your neighbor, right? I want to steal his session token, right? But that can be really hard. That can carry a lot more consequences with it than uh, you may expect. We'll talk about consequences in the next slide. Um, so I find it very useful to set up a bot, and, and it's the purpose of the bot is to trigger these JavaScript injection vulnerabilities. 
uh, and skipping to the good part, that very last line, uh, Selenium, right? A lot of us may have used Selenium. It's great for web scripting. PhantomJS, right? It's a headless browser, but it has the JavaScript engine built in. So it will actually load up the page. It will process all that JavaScript. It won't waste cycles trying to render the page, but it will do all the actions that you need it to in terms of triggering XSS. So that's, that's my, my pro tip there. All right, last criteria for our individual challenge. What happens when they exploit it, right? Um, obviously, one is we'd like to somehow give them points, right? So they need to get a flag. Uh, again, falling back to our JavaScript injection vulnerability. If I steal your session token, how does that give me a flag? And there's multiple solutions to this. One thing is you could actually have a separate cookie called flag and tell people to try to steal that cookie instead of the session token, right? That, that would be plausible. They'd, they'd get a lot of the same benefit out of there. Um, one other thing I like to do is in the application, if there's any way to plant a message for a particular user, whether that be a, a logon message, whether that be um, a page that's only displayed to a particular role, somewhere it's usually pretty easy to tuck a message where you have to be user X in order to read it. And then you just make the text of that message, you know, congratulations, you've solved challenge two, here's your flag, right? So think through that way that uh, if you have a scoring mechanism, you need to, for each challenge, that needs to tie back to some method of scoring. The second thing you need to think about in terms of consequences is what kind of additional privileges did they just gain? Right? If I've stolen my victim bot's session, so I'm now logged in under they, their role, were they admin? Right? It's lots of fun. We'd like to be able to let our players get admin in the application. But when they're admin, does that let them reset their neighbor's password? Does it let them completely change the style of the site or disable the function that you wanted to be vulnerable? Right? If it gives them too much power, you have to stay away from it. Um, and I will say uh, the ultimate fun to me is getting a shell, right? Probably would be for the developers as well. What can we do on the operating system itself? And that's a great final challenge, but recognize that if they have operating system level access, they're going to be able to read the code. They're going to be able to find all of the other answers and bypass your challenges. So if you have a vulnerability that leads to that level of access, it's got to be at the end, right? You've got to structure it that way. Speaking of structure, right? Once we've got all of our individual challenges, we need to make sure that they flow in a logical path. Um, now again, if you're doing a, uh, a challenge for somewhat experienced testers, you can have lots of parallel paths. And maybe you chain two or three together, right, to give them a sense of progression. Um, but it's, it can be a lot of fun to have lots of styles of vulnerabilities and people can kind of pick their favorite or maybe just the one they think they need to work on and go after it that way. Um, this is a, a line from uh, uh, actually the capture the flag I ran this year for my company. Um, anyway, the specific vulnerabilities don't matter so much. Just mentally lay them out. How do you expect them to be exploited? Now, if you're t doing a, uh, a capture the flag event for a group of developers, again, you might want to approach it a little bit differently. In this case, I put all of the, or at least most of the vulnerabilities linear linearly. Um, kind of fun to have some others off to the side that people can work on if they finish one early. But if you arrange them in a progression, ideally one that takes them from no access external web user all the way to, in this case, two ways to get shell, that's really fun. That's really satisfying as a participant. The other thing it lets you do is you can insert checkpoints, right? You can tell people, okay, we're going to go for an hour on this. And maybe a half an hour in, you can say, hey, is everybody looking at this page, right? Has everybody gotten their JavaScript injection to pop an alert box? Okay, yeah, that's great. Well, how about the next step? Can you have it call home, right? It, it really sets you up to be able to go around, keep people kind of together, and help them have a successful experience. Um, so again, that, that's definitely a tip. If you're running this for inexperienced users, try to arrange them in some sort of sequential fashion. Unless, of course, you're running Hypergate and there's a unauthorized direct admin page that lets you run arbitrary SQL. That breaks everything. Just saying. All right. Uh, separate. Minor topic. One slide on it. Scoreboards. Uh, having a scoreboard adds to the fun. People like competition in general. Um, scoreboards are also useful for hints, right? If you've got a challenge up there that says uh, secret API command, right? 
that tells people that I better be going and looking at the API. There's something to be found there. Um, so the scoreboard itself can be used for breadcrumbs. There's a number of different pieces of software out there that work for this. Um, some of them focus on different types of capture the flag events, like Jeopardy style is one that's common, generally not one that's good for classes. Um, but there are definitely uh, software out there that you can use. This screenshot is one from one called CTFD. Other than a uh, five minute peruse, it looks like it would be good. I haven't personally run it, but it could be an option. All right, a couple more topics to, uh, to cover and uh, we're, we're rounding out on time. Okay, perfect, perfect. All right, where are you going to run this event? Um, if you're like me, your first thought is gonna be, I'm just gonna develop it on my laptop, right? Or, or install it there and throw it on the corporate Wi-Fi. It'll be fine, right? Everybody has access, everybody's trusted. You might find that your local IT staff is not so supportive of that plan. Uh, turns out they don't like it so much when you run rogue servers. Uh, they don't like it so much when you start launching a bunch of attacks over their network, which hopefully is running an IDS that you've now lit up like a Christmas tree. Right? So your, loan, your own network is probably not an option. Um, second option, bring your own infrastructure. Uh, I've had a lot of success with rolling out a cheap switch I found on eBay, right? It has a bunch of ports on it. Um, to be honest, it was actually more expensive to buy a whole bunch of network cables that were long enough to reach the corners of the server room or the, the conference room. Uh, that ended up costing me more. Um, but you have this gear for a couple hundred bucks, you can be all kitted out to run your own hardwired local network. Um, one other bit, a lot of the laptops, an RJ45 port is just too big to put in a modern laptop, so you may need a supply of USB to Ethernet adapters. Um, the other advantage that this kind of setup has is all of your game traffic is confined, but you can still let your players on the corporate Wi-Fi to Google search something, right? How do I exploit this? How do, what's my syntax there? Um, it helps to be able to have those reference materials. So this is a quick and easy way to get your dual networks going. Um, it works out well. Uh, side note, though, uh, if you're running your own hardwired network, there's no DHCP unless you put it there. So you may want to give that some thought of setting up a quick little DHCP server, maybe a DNS server, whatever infrastructure you want to have available. How about the cloud, right? This was the most glowy, magical picture. I wish I had a sound effect. Ah, oh, the cloud, right? Um, turns out the cloud is actually a really good, uh, like a capture the flag event files right in that wheelhouse. Temporary infrastructure, we want it up and then we want to destroy it and burn it to the ground because we don't know what kind of bugs the developers were able to insert in there, right? Um, so, so the cloud works great for that. Um, we, uh, the most recent class that was run, uh, and, and I say was run because my, my coworker there actually did the running, but he worked up this script. Jo uh, we used Amazon, right? Spins up its own virtual private cloud. Uh, we tell it how many students, and for every 10 students, it gives us one uh, target server. Uh, this particular client, uh, we're going to talk about workstations in a second, but they wanted that in the cloud too. So it spins up, everybody has their own virtual machine, tools already installed. All we had to do was type a script with a couple of parameters and it just appears, right? The other nice thing about that is if you get halfway through the game and somebody really borks your application, right, does something unexpected, you just nuke it, stand up a new one and you're ready to go, right? So even if I'm bringing my own infrastructure, I always run my target servers as some sort of virtual machine, like Vagrant, Puppet, something like that. Um, really handy, really convenient. Uh, and minimal infrastructure costs, right? You, you can spend some money for your one-time class, but you don't necessarily need to invest in any hardware long-term. Okay, I made an allusion to your, your players, right? What tools are they going to be using? Um, option one, starting with the bad ones again, Give them a list of software to install, right? You can install Zap and maybe Hydra and who knows whatever else tools you want to use. That really is problematic. I don't know if you've had, any of you have ever run a class like that, but trying to convince people to actually do the prerequisites just doesn't happen. So what you end up doing is you spend the first who knows how long of class trying to get things set up right. Uh, second thing is, again, your, your corporate IPT department, which you may or may not be part of, probably has uh, policies against installing random software. Uh, so they not, not, might not like some of the tools that you install. A lot of them have a habit of triggering antivirus. So that's not such a good route. 
Um, I've been a really big fan of using a virtual machine. Kali, there's other options, but I love Kali. Uh, they publish their own virtual machine images. They're ready to go. So you can send your participants a link, download VirtualBox or VMware, whatever, uh, download the image ahead of time, and you stand up. Everybody's starting from the same, uh, same base uh, image, right? So when it comes time to give directions to explain to people how to do something, when you say click on the second icon from the top, it's the second icon from the top from every, for everybody. Uh, so it's a really nice starting place. Uh, also, if your developers still didn't do the prerequisites or your players, uh, you can have a USB drive, and you copy the image over, copy the install file, and 10, 15 minutes, you're up and running. So uh, that works really well. Third option, as I already, already mentioned, a cloud workstation, exact same thing. You're starting with it from the same starting point, and uh, you can control it ahead of time. Okay, so um, let's, uh, let's wrap this up, right? I do want to be open about some of the disadvantages. Um, listed out there, right? Number one, the cost. This takes some investment in order to come up with one of these events. This isn't something uh, that you can very easily just, you know, download some software. Well, it takes infrastructure around it, right? Even if you do use one of the deliberately vulnerable applications. Um, and so that, that infrastructure, the time to set this up, there's cost associated with that. Also, you're pulling your developers away from their work for, you know, probably a full day. Right? There's costs associated with that. That cost is going to be greater than your computer-based training or your instructor-led training. Maybe, maybe equivalent to instructor-led. Um, but the idea is, in this case, you're, it's something you would do after those other trainings. Probably this is something that we do to drive home the lessons that we've taught there. Um, but it is additional cost. Um, coverage, another thing I want to talk about, right? In an instructor-led class, I can go through half a dozen, maybe more types of vulnerabilities in a day. In a capture the flag, they're really only going to be able to exploit a handful of those, right? For developers who are new to this, three. Probably three types of vulnerabilities is all you're going to get through. Maybe four. Um, so you're not going to get the breadth that you get from the other styles of training, but they're really going to understand the mechanics, the ins and outs of those types of vulnerabilities. Um, and then predictability, depending on how you structured your CTF, you don't necessarily know how far they're going to get through, right? Maybe, maybe they only get two of the four vulnerabilities that you hoped they would. However, let's take one more minute and talk about the pros, right? So back to our tactical goals. We're trying to, you know, get the, our participants, our developers, to really internalize this attack. And, and I'm hoping that you can imagine the, the light bulb that goes on in people's heads, right? It's one thing to talk about input validation, right? It's, it's one thing to talk about the importance. Bad things, right? Finger wave. Bad things can happen if you don't sanitize your input, right? But the moment that a developer actually feeds a function the wrong input and completely changes the, uh, the purpose of that SQL statement or, you know, attacks their neighbor and, right, gets their session cookie, the moment they actually do that themselves, they can never unsee that again, right? Every time they come to a SQL statement, they're always going to look at that and say, could I attack this, right? They know, that they know how to do it, and so they're always going to, to look at that and say, could I do this, right? When their neighbor, who maybe didn't have the benefit of taking the Capture the Flag class, uh, when they write their, their unparameterized query, uh, you know, they're going to jump all over it and say, not just it's policy that we don't do it this way, they're going to say, if you write that, I can own your database, right? And so that kind of change in perspective, putting them in the attacker's mindset is, is the thing that is going to permanently change the culture around security, right? Um, people are going to stop seeing this as a policy, and they're going to really understand the bad things that can happen as a result. So why run a CTF? I would argue it's the best way to apply the knowledge taught. Um, you're going to extend the skills. Uh, and, and you're going to reinforce that culture. Now, my dream someday is to find a customer who wants to take it to this level. I think it would be awesome not to run a one-time event, but to have a kind of continuous CTF going, right? Where you set up, let's say, 12 challenges, one a month, right? And they're simple challenges. The, the intent is this is only going to take maybe an hour to figure out. 
Day one is going to be you know, a, an authentication bug where you're giving too much information back and so it lets you, you know, uh, maybe brute force a simple password. Uh, month two might be uh, you know, SQL injection, whatever. You spread these out and you arrange it so that uh, developers do this. You know, maybe you give them an hour a day on Friday. Maybe you just ask them to work it in. And then you throw out gift cards, right? A $20 Starbucks gift card sure goes a long way, right? Um, and so you, you keep tabs. Maybe you have bigger prizes for the first person who solves it each month. But more importantly, you give a prize for the people who solve all 12. And that's going to repetitively get people thinking about security. And uh, once they do it there in the test environment and then go back to their own code, they're going to be, be translating those same sorts of issues. So I think this would be awesome. I just need a customer who would be willing to buy it so that I can write it. So that's it. Uh, any questions? And again, uh, if you want, the, uh, the microphone is there in the middle, or uh, just yell out and I'll repeat the question. So I've, I've built a couple of CTFs, and the biggest challenge that I've faced is trying to come up with the framework around it. The individual challenges have taken a lot of the approaches that you've talked about, but to try and build that into a storyline and then um, uh, just build out the, the scoreboard and, and keep it interactive and um, shovel out hints, uh, especially if you don't have it attended where you have an instructor leading it. Um, do you have any thoughts on where to get started in building out the framework around it? So um, I've, I like using applications and having multiple vulnerabilities in the same application. Um, to me, that, that lends itself fairly easily to a good storyline. I also like the feel of starting from unprivileged and gaining more and more privileges as I go through the application. So to me, those um, help contribute to the storyline feel of it. Um, I've taken... Uh, scenarios that we might come across uh, in, well, in my work at least, right? A small business environment. Uh, if you think about what kinds of systems, what kind of applications they might have, that helps me come up with some kind of storyline around it, right? Um, personally, I keep my scoreboard completely separate. That seems like a different application. Um, but, uh, um, yeah, having that, that progression of gradually escalating privileges, to me, is the most satisfying way to build that out. Yes? So where your participants are scattered out. Right, right. OK, so the question is, uh, how might you run a virtual capture the flag event, right? Um, uh, so. I think the cloud solution lends itself very well to that, right? Right. I mean, yeah, anytime you run a global event or a global application, you run into uh, time zone differences, right? And so uh, that your communication is, is kind of depends on your group, right? If you're using instant messenger, well, time zone aside, uh, you know, you just rely, I would have to fall back on whatever I'm using to communicate with my team that way. Um, I don't know that the capture the flag event itself helps or hurts that particular aspect of it. Um, I have done, we, we ran an event where we had people in classrooms in three different locations and I was only, or my team was only present in one of them. That worked out okay, but I haven't tried to do it uh, at uh, asynchronous times, right, where they're at, uh, working on it at, at totally different times. All right, a couple people with the microphone. Uh, and uh, first, I apologize if you covered this earlier. I got tied up and I wanted to get to your session. Um, um, so I came in a little bit late. Uh -huh. So um, forgive me if you've already answered this question. Um, I, so I do a lot of training events and our capstones are typically Jeopardy board style uh, CTFs. Uh, we do red versus blue also. Okay. Uh, but one of the things I think people struggle with is um, where to get their own copy of the, the boards themselves, the scoring boards. Did you cover that? And if not, can you show folks where they might find some? Uh, 
I only had one slide on it, uh, and to be honest, I uh, I Googled CTF scoreboard. Right. Okay. The challenge is. Uh, like you say, there's different styles, different formats of CTF events. So some of them are designed for Jeopardy style. Some of them are designed for other things. So um, uh, I, it depends on what style of event you're trying to run. I, I don't have specific recommendations there. Yeah, I just don't know if there was any open source project. We wrote our own um, okay. in the end, but I was Th there curious. There definitely are open source. Um, so I have a screenshot from CTFD, right? And, mm -hmm. and that one is offered as a service, but they also... Uh, offer the, it, you can download the source code and run it yourself. That's kind of their model. Okay. All right. Thanks. So, an, an option. Yeah. Thank you. And, and just, uh, we are at time. So if you uh, are ready to head out, I, I won't take it personally, but let's answer this last question. Yeah. So um, a lot of the CTFs that I've done have all been uh, web app based. Uh -huh. um, but I was kind of wondering, do you know if there's any resources for places to find VMs with uh, like unpatched OS is similar to like an OSCP light. Um, right. Something that would be a little right. more, you know, going after unpatched vulnerabilities, um, more at the network le layer, less uh, web app style. Right, right. yes. Um, oh, gosh, I've got to think of the name. Uh, well, first off, let me point you back to the, that OWASP project. There was a, a tab there for virtual machines, mm -hmm. which I think might be along that line. Um, I can't come up with it off the top of my head. There, there's another individual that's, you know, taken the time to gather those types of resources. And I, I have a URL for it, but uh, uh, you'd have to come get to me, and, and I'll, right. I'll give it to you there. Cool. All right. Okay. Well, thanks, everyone, for attending.